I seek refuge with God, the one beyond all needs, the one beyond all limitations and all deficiencies. I seek refuge with Him from every form of evil. Whether it be non-existential things that we describe in terms that you call evil, such as poverty. You say it's evil, but it's really just the lack of wealth. You say ignorance is evil, but really it's just the non-existence of knowledge. You say these different terms, in reality they don't exist, but we call them evil. This is one form of evil. What doesn't really exist, but because of its lacking nature, we call it evil. It's not that God created that form of evil because there was nothing to create. It was just an absence, a lack, a non-existence. But I also seek refuge with God from a second form of evil, which is relative evil. Relative evil is something that does exist, but it's only evil when you measure it up against something else. Take, for example, the example of a knife. A knife in itself, what's wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with it? In itself, it has its own function. It has its own aesthetic value. It has its own aesthetic value. It has its own look to it. It has its own nature. It can be used for different purposes. In some cases, God forbid, it can be used to commit acts of aggression against others. And in that case, we say, that is evil. But really, we're not talking about the knife in and of itself. We're talking about the how, how the knife is relative to that person who it hurt. So this is a second form of evil, called relative evil. This is also something that God created in and of itself, something to be good. But we describe it relatively as evil when we measure it up against other things. And I seek refuge with God from the third form of evil, which is the truest and realest that evil can get, as I mentioned a couple of nights ago. And that's the evil that we, or that other beings with agency, are responsible for. God gave us agency. God gave us freedom. He gave us the choice. Either come closer to the light of excellence and guidance, or turn our backs show ingratitude, be thankless, and choose the wrong options, commit evil acts. I seek refuge with God from the evil of my own acts, God forbid, from the evil of my own choice making, and the evil of all of those agents that may commit wrong choices, whether they be humans or jinn, or any other creature that you can fathom that has an ability to make a choice. 
indeed, all good comes from God. And the evil, it either doesn't really exist, like the first form, or it's only relative, something that's good in and of itself, but relative to other things, we describe it as evil. Or third, it's evil whose responsibility, who bears it? Is it God? God gave him the choice. That's a good thing. The one who bears the responsibility for that choice, that evil, is the person who makes that choice. And I begin in the name of God, the one with all perfections, the one with all excellent qualities, the one who is not bound by any bounds, no limitations. He is in no need. All praise belongs to Him. I thank Him and I ask Him to shower peace and blessings upon the chosen ones. Righteous one after righteous one. Chosen one after chosen one. Prophet after prophet. Messenger after messenger. Software after software. Updated version after updated version. Until he sent the last chosen one. The last prophet. The seal of all prophets and messengers. The one with the most updated software. For us to reach our purpose as human beings. To reach our potential excellence that he meant for us to have by creating this entire universe and making us the inhabitants of this universe, putting it at our disposal so that we can come closer and closer to Him. He gave us the role model and the special message that is the seal of all those messages is the message of Islam at the hands of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But He did not leave the message to be lost. He did not make all of his efforts, the efforts of the prophets and messengers, he did not make that all go in vain by leaving them to their own whims and their own choice making which may go astray. Rather, he knew before he created all of this that if he were to test his creatures, there would be a number of them who would be able to guide the others, who would make the right choices, who would be qualified to receive the guidance from God and make sure that they remain impeccable, infallible, immaculate, so that they can be qualified leaders for the rest of humanity and so that they can achieve the purpose for which God created everything. These are the prophets and the messengers, but not only the prophets and the messengers. For when the last prophet and messenger departs this world, the purpose of guidance must be maintained. Safeguarding the message must be fulfilled. And that is at the hands of a living, walking, talking guardian appointed by God. He is not a prophet. He is not a messenger in the sense that a prophet was. He does not receive prophetic revelation. Wahi, Nabawi. No. But he is linked to God in a very special way. He is a disciple of that last prophet and messenger. He is somebody to live up to the standard of the message. This is what we refer to as the Imam. The Imam lives as a, as a guarantee of that quality of guidance that God wants for us. Impeccable guidance. He fulfills the message. He fulfills the purpose of God's creation of human beings. God wanted human beings to fulfill the purpose of truly knowing Him. Through worship, we come closer to re realizing and becoming aware of God. In the Holy Quran, God says, مَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the humans and the jinn except that they may worship me. And in some reports it explains that this worship leads to ma'rifah. It leads to liya'rifun. So that we may become aware of God. Conscious of God. A certain quality of our being. We transform. We become a higher level. Of, we come to higher levels of excellence and closeness to God through worship. Who is it that fulfills that purpose in every day and age? So that God's creation of human beings and jinn is not in vain. In vain? Who is it that fulfills that purpose in every day and age? At the very least, it is the living guardian of the message of God on earth who fulfills that worship in the best way and shape and form and who guards the message for all the rest of us so that we know 
When we follow the message of Ahlul Bayt, we know that at least we have a message that is intact enough to be considered God's message on earth. Because if need be, the living guardian would be behind the scenes there to make sure that we have what we need. He would be there, ready to intervene when people are ready to submit to the truth. I mentioned some of these ideas yesterday, but I want to comment on something that may have come to some of our minds. Some of us may be wondering, well, what do you mean perfect guidance, impeccable guidance, immaculate guidance? Don't we follow maraja today? And these maraja disagree in their opinions? Some of them are right maybe, some of them are wrong. So where's the impeccable guidance? The answer is very straightforward. God does His part because of His beautiful qualities and His excellence. Because He is in no need and He only does out of His generosity for us, has mercy on us. He chooses to do what is befitting of His generosity. كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِي الرَّحْمَةِ he has written it incumbent upon himself to be merciful. So God always provides on his end what would be the most befitting form of guidance. He always provides for us that guidance. He does his part. He creates the circumstances which can lead to the existence of an imam. And the imam also as a sign of God, as a beautiful walking, talking message of God on earth does his part as well by making sure he's prepared to lead and he's prepared to be there when people are ready and people have not have taken down the barriers that keep them from that guidance so God does his part the imam does his part so where's the problem if we don't if we don't have all the answers today if we don't have impeccable leadership where's the problem is it on God's end? No. Is it on the Imam's end? No. Then whose end is there left? لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ As in one verse in the Holy Quran says, the idea that God sends the prophets and messengers so that people will uphold justice. People have a role to play. People have a development process to, to, to go through. People have a responsibility. Oppressors, if they go out and try to kill every imam, as occurred in history, imam after imam. People have a role to play and have a responsibility and there are consequences. If people have not done their part and prepared the grounds on their end, then they may be deprived because of their own wrongdoing of having access to that impeccable leadership but let's say overnight everybody on earth or enough people on earth at least came to their senses enough people on earth a threshold was reached of people who were preparing the grounds properly readying themselves turning back to God sincerely repenting to God coming to know God better changing deep down in their hearts, becoming better people, ready for the leader appointed by God to guide them and take them to the next step, then rest assured, dear brothers and sisters, have no doubt that Imam would appear. If the time was right and people were ready and the ground was paved, the road was paved, what would have kept the Imam from making himself publicly known? He and the network through which he works behind the scenes are doing their work. But are we being part of it? Are we doing our part? The need for the Imam remains the same, regardless whether we personally have access to him or not. But we can try our best to pave the road through each and every one of us each of, each of our individual efforts and then as a collective community. God Almighty says in the Holy Quran and I begin after Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim 
Say, I do not ask you any reward for it except mawadda for my relatives or for my qurba. Now, you probably have heard this verse many times in the context of how the followers of Ahl al-Bayt refer to this verse as something which indicates a station specific to Al-Qurba. These relatives of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who are being honored for a wisdom by God. God would not honor somebody simply because of something that is not worthy of any recognition. Therefore, when we look at the word qurba here, we need to think and contemplate. Is this recognition simply because they're blood relatives? Or is it because of a special station that God is trying to direct our attention to? We are all the children of Adam, a prophet sent by God. Not all of us, however, are children of other prophets. Some of us, some of our of our community, some of the world is descendants of <coughs> Prophet Abraham. Some are specifically descendants of Nabi Ismail, Ishmael. And some are specifically descendants of Hashim, the grandfather or of the ancestors of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are referred to as the Sada. Then you have those who are descendants of Prophet Muhammad himself, through his lady, who through his daughter Lady Fatima, peace be upon her. Is this lineage something merely about blood, a bloodline issue? Many people, if you read different works on the history of Shi'ism, and you see the way that they describe the history of the development of Shi'i, the Shi'i community. They focus on the idea of lineage. You see, this is a recurrent theme. And it may even be something in the perceptions of many of our community members. But there's a very important thing to keep in mind when we look into historical accounts. Or we look at current perceptions in our communities. How do you prove God exists? Do you look it up in a history book? No, no, obviously not. Alaykum as Rather, even if you're in a laboratory, how do you prove that there's a causal relationship between this thing that I started to do and the results that I observed? How do you know that there's a causal relationship? Can you see causality with your eyes? Can you see it? Like, let's say right now, I raise this and then I raise this. I raise my, my phone and then I raise the Quran. This happened and then this followed right away. Did this cause this to happen? How do you know it didn't just occur together? How do you know it was a cause, a causal relationship? This caused this as opposed to they just occurred together. How do you know? Your intellect, your sound reasoning has a role to play. The lens through which you see the world has a role to play. You know it to be true. When I push this with my phone, my sound reasoning tells me that's surely a causal relationship. I can tell the difference between something just occurring together and when there's a causal relationship. Something causing something else. This is not something that I observe tangibly. It's something that I analyze with my mind. Similarly, when I look at events in history, I don't simply figure out everything there is to be figured out by looking at what different accounts historically have said. I have my own analysis through which I read what happened. I see different accounts and I start to read in between the lines. I see some accounts say 
that this person that the Quran, the living miracle of the Quran describes as somebody of extraordinary character. That is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. I see I see that in some accounts he's described in terms that don't make sense, that don't that don't coincide with being of extraordinary character. So what do I do? Do I say, ah, uh, history forces me to say that the Qur'an is mistaken? Or do I do the opposite? I say, wait a second. My sound reasoning has shown me that this is a book, there, the likes of which there is none other. This is a book that has scientific descriptions, the likes of which could not have been brought forth by somebody 1400 years ago. How could somebody 1400 years ago have known that at one point the heavens and the earth were into one mass and then God split them apart and that God is expanding them? As the Quran, if you read through different verses in the Quran, you'll see these types of descriptions. How could somebody 1400 years ago have described in terms that are eerily similar to what we think today about how or what we know today about how the earth revolves around itself. And you see the Quran describes how the mountains, you think that they are standing still, but they're moving like the clouds move by. How could that have been described in a book about 1400 years ago and not be something from out of this world? How could such a book be something that is man-made when those experts of the Arabic language at the time until this very day have not been able to successfully bring forth any, any practical challenge to its distinct language and its literary quality coupled with its moral message and all of the different parables and stories that teach ethical lessons in it. It gives you a legal apparatus. It gives you a legal system. It gives you all of these different functions that when you take them coupled with each other, pile all this, these clues onto one another, you come to the result with your sound reasoning, this could not have been brought forth by a typical person. This requires special assistance from beyond. And if God is watching and seeing this happen, and sees that people are taken aback by this miraculous occurrence, and He just lets it happen, then it must mean that God is giving His stamp of approval. Because God would not mislead us when we have no other way to figure things out. So because your sound reasoning shows you this, what do you then do? You look to the events of history and you say, I will judge you based on the Quran and not the opposite. Because the events of history may have been corrupted by those who are transmitting those events. Oh, somebody may have added a little salt here, a little pepper there. Somebody may have made up some of the details. Somebody may have had different motives when they were relaying certain things. Some people may have been blinded that they didn't even believe in God, let alone in the Prophet. They may have relayed things in a way to corrupt the message. So what do I do? I take the living miracle that I have today, that I'm sure of what it means, in the verses that I'm sure, and I look back in history and I see what were these different reports that were mentioned. And I start to sift through them based on what I know to be true right now. Why can I do this? I can do this because you never raise your hand, let go, abandon that which you know to be true for the sake of something that could or could not be true. We need to reflect on the value of historical accounts, dear brothers and sisters. Today in academia, there is a great emphasis placed on history. Rigorous historical studies. But I invite you all to actually look twice, look deeper into what really you can say about history with certainty with confidence beyond reasonable doubt. And tell me, what are you more sure of right now? Some of the historical accounts, that there are different varying conflicting narratives about them, or about what you know today 
with your sound reasoning. Some people may look to history to understand the Prophet Muhammad Some people may look to history to understand the Imams, Imam Ali Some people may look to history to know who were the Imams, one after the other. But, dear brothers and sisters, you may and may not be successful when you do so. Another approach, a more successful approach, is to simply consider historical accounts as part of your research. It doesn't make or break it, because what has been mentioned, there are different accounts, different versions, different interpretations. Different weight is placed on different sources, different weight is placed on different narratives, based on different criteria. The more sure approach is to combine both a historical approach and an approach based on sound reason. See what you can prove with your sound reason. You know you exist. You know you didn't create yourself, nor did something like you create you. Therefore, something that is not like you created you. You know that God exists. You know that the God who is not like you has every perfection that you lack. He has every excellence that you do not have. He has all the wisdom that I do not have. He has all the knowledge that I do not have. He is the one of all kindness and all generosity. Would he have created us in vain? No, you know, he has a purpose then. If a typical human being has enough wisdom to do things with a purpose in mind, if a typical generous person is kind enough to leave the things that he is leaving behind to proper care and guidance, then you know God will do the same. Even better in the most possible way you can think of. The highest possible perfection you can think of. Then, with that in mind, you start to know, okay, there must be guides, there must be prophets, there must be messengers. So you start to search in history for what you know you should expect already. You look for it. This is part of the methodology and the approach that we can take when we're looking back in history so that we know things with certainty. We know things beyond the shadow of a doubt. When you take all the pieces of the puzzle, put them together, you come to that conclusion. I wanted to share with you, as we remember Imam Ali alayhi salam, there were many things I wanted to talk about tonight, but it came to my attention that this was an important point to focus on, the issue of how we approach the study of history and how do we know things to begin with. Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that in the coming nights. However, I wanted to focus on an exchange between Imam Ali salam and one of his companions in the moments before his death. As you know from the famous sermon of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says When Imam Ali asks him, why are you crying? The Prophet says أَبْكِي لِمَا يُسْتَحَلُّ مِنْكَ فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ كَأَنِّي بِكَ وَأَنْتَ تُصَلِّي لِرَبِّكَ He says basically I'm crying for what will happen to you in this month as if I can see you while you are in prayer. And this is related by Sheikh al Saduq, Ayun al Akbar, and other sources, Amali by Sheikh al Saduq. So, this is at least in these early accounts, those sources that had survived to the time of Sheikh al Saduq tell us that Imam Ali was struck while he was in prayer, according to this report. One of the close companions of Imam Ali, who is known as Al Asbah, Asbagh ibn Nabata, as related by Sheikh al Tusi, as well as Sheikh al Mufid, two of our earliest scholars from the 5th century after the Hijrah, they say that when he came to Imam Ali in those moments after he was struck, imagine Imam Ali, peace be upon him, alayhi salam. Asbagh, he asks Imam Ali, according to this report, he says, Tell me a hadith from the Prophet that you've heard from him. Maybe this is the last one that I'll hear from you. He was expecting this was the last one. They say Imam Ali says, yes, Asbah. 
the Messenger of God had invited me once. I'll paraphrase this because for the sake of time. He basically says to him, go to my mosque, call people to you, praise God, ask God to shower peace and blessings upon me, and then tell them, oh people, I'm the messenger of the messenger of God. I'm the messenger from the messenger of God sent to you. And he tells you that God has expelled from his mercy as well as the angels, they also pray that God expels from His mercy these individuals. Who are they? The prophets, the messengers, and the Prophet Muhammad himself all pray that God expels these individuals from His mercy. Who are they? They are the ones who claim a lineage that does not belong to them. Or they claim to have a mawla that is not theirs or they oppress somebody who is doing their doing work for them they don't give him their due wage they don't give them their due compensation they say when imam ali went, up, went and did this according to this report when imam ali said this nobody spoke except for umar ibn al-khattab what did he say? He said, You have delivered, O oh, Abul Hassan, O oh, Ali. However, you have said something that is not mufassal. Basically, what is the meaning of this? What's the explanation to be meant from this? So the Imam Ali, pinned, he went to the Prophet and he told him what happened. The Prophet told him, Go back to them and tell them the following. Ayyuhan Nas, ما كنا لنجيئكم بشيء إلا وعندنا تأويله وتفسيره ألا وإني أنا أبوكم ألا وإني أنا مولاكم ألا وإني أنا أجيو He tells them go back to the people and tell them we have the تأويل and the تفسير He tells them then what did that really mean? What was the meaning that he was getting across that Prophet told him? Didn't he say that God expels from mercy those who claim a lineage that is not theirs, claim fathers that are not theirs? He says, indeed, I am your father. So if, in other words, if you claim that you have a father other than me, that, is, that qualifies you to be expelled from God's mercy. He says, I am your mawla. I'm the one with authority. I'm the guardian. I'm the master over, I'm the one who was given this authority by God over you. And he says, I am Ajirukum. I am the one. Remember the verse we started with? God is, tells the Prophet, tell them I do not ask you for compensation for this except the love of my qurba, that compensation. He says, I am the one that is working for you. The one if you deprive me of my compensation then you become qualified to be expelled from God's mercy. Dear brothers and sisters, remember the verse in the Quran that says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Your guardian is only God, His messenger, the faithful who maintain the prayer and give the zakat while bowing down. All Muslims, they say that this is Imam Ali, peace be upon him. The wali, the word mawla and wali are related in the roots. The idea of wilaya. Dear brothers and sisters, let's go back to the city of Kufa. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, is in his last moments. On a light like this, imagine with me, dear brothers and sisters. Can you imagine Imam Ali, peace be upon him? They say that one of his companions, the same one we started with, Asbab, he says, when that, when that enemy, when Ibn Muljam struck Imam Ali, 
We went to see him at his house. We stood listening. They started to hear the cries out of the house of Imam Ali. They heard people weeping and crying. Then they say, Imam Hassan, the son of Imam Ali, came out. And he told them, Imam Ali tells you to go. Maybe he didn't want them to sit there listening to the cries. They say that many of those companions, they left. But then Asbar, he stayed. He still stayed there listening and he heard further cries. Then Imam Hassan came out again and he says, Alam sarifu. Did I not tell you to leave? Then he says, No way, O oh, oh, son of God's messenger. I cannot myself will allow me to go. My feet won't take me to leave until I see the commander of the faithful. Peace and blessings be upon him. They, had, they say that Imam Hassan had them wait. And then he said he had them wait. And then it wasn't long before he came out again. And then he told him to come in. He came into the presence of Imam Ali. He saw him having something tied over his forehead. It was covering his head where he was struck. And the blood has, had been gushing out so much. Imam Ali had lost so much blood. They say that his face had, had become pale. And the color of that band, the color of that turban he was wearing had a pale color also. He says, Asbah says, I don't know which had a paler color. Was it this amama, this turban he was wearing? Or was it his face? And then he says that he went and he started to hug Imam Ali. He started to kiss him and he was crying. Imam Ali, peace be upon him, says to him, لا تبكي يا أصبغ فإنها والله الجنة He says, oh Asbah, don't cry. I swear that it's, it's going to be paradise. I'm headed towards paradise. Then they say, Asbah said, جعل تفيدات, may I be sacrificed for you? I know, I swear, I know to God that you will go to paradise. But I am crying because I am losing you. I am crying because I am missing you, O oh, commander of the faithful. Imagine, dear brothers and sisters, if you had a leader like Imam Ali, how would you feel if you were going to lose him? Dear brothers and sisters, there was another companion. This is related by Shaykh al -Sadouk. Imagine, he says, he went and he saw Imam Ali, peace be upon him, when he was in this illness that he became, that he passed away from. He says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, ma jurhuka hadha bi shay, wa ma bika min bas. He's trying to make it light on Imam Ali. He says, oh, this is not much, this is not a big deal, Imam Ali, you'll be okay. He's trying to make it kind of bring up his spirits, maybe he thinks he's trying to relieve him. Then Imam Ali tells him, Ya Habib, he swears by God, no indeed, this is the end, I'm leaving you very soon. Then he says, he starts to cry. And then they say that Um Kulthum, the daughter of Imam Ali was there, she starts to cry as well. She was sitting there. And then Imam Ali asks her, what is making you cry? She says, I remembered that you're going to leave us soon. So I started to cry. Imam Ali tells her, my daughter, don't cry. I swear, if you were only to see what I'm seeing right now, you would not be crying. Then Habib asked him, what is it you're seeing, O commander of the faithful? He says, I see the angels of the heavens, I see the prophets, oh, they're all around there, they're ready to receive me. This is my brother, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he's sitting right here, he's telling me come to us, for what is head ahead of you is better than what you have. Dear brothers and sisters, come with me to those moments. Imagine at the time that Imam Ali was struck, who was there to receive him. Imagine his son Imam Hassan comes. Imagine Imam Hassan is bursting into tears because he realizes what a great tragedy this is. Imagine, can you think Imam Ali, is he trying to console his son Imam Hassan? Is he trying to tell him, don't worry my son, it's okay, it'll be okay. But then, dear brothers and sisters, imagine a little later, if Imam Hussein comes by, he's crying as well, can you see? And 
And then what does Imam Ali do? Does he try to console him as well? Does he think of what's going to happen to him in Karbala? Dear brothers and sisters, but then imagine after they take Imam Ali, peace be upon him, into his room. Take him out of the mosque, into his room. And you see all of the different family members gathered around him. Imagine you're standing there with Imam Ali and you see he has all of the women and the daughters there. He sees them crying. Imagine he sees Lady Zainab. Imagine he sees his daughter Um Kulthum. What's crossing Imam Ali's mind? Imagine Imam Ali. Maybe he's thinking of Lady Zainab and how she'll be taken as a captive. Maybe he's thinking of how he won't be there to defend his daughter, Lady Zainab. We ask you for the sake of Imam Ali to accept the little that we have offered. We ask you to hasten the appearance of the Imam of our time to make us of the sincere followers. We ask you, Ya Allah, to have our peace and our greetings reach the Imam of our time and have his peace and greetings reach us. We ask you, Ya Allah, to make us pleasing to the Imam of our time. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us the certainty that will make us always work for you sincerely. We ask you, Ya Allah, to give us the knowledge, the love, and the will to do what is right. We ask you, Ya Allah, for no one should be asked of you. You are our master. We are the servants. We are the ones in need of you. No one is to be asked but you. You are the only one who can give and take. You are Mawlai Ya My master, my master, you are the master and I am the slave. Who will have mercy on the slaves except for the master? And the last of our prayers, O subhanallah, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein.